Hey guys, um, I'm Liv, as Chris just said, um, and yeah, I'm also part of the um, part of GPSN. So I'm just going to present like a few um, MCQ questions. If you could just go into the chat, I've posted uh, the link to this Socrative room thing, um, and then type in GPSN to enter the room. Um, and then, yeah, there's some people answering already. So you can just fire away straight away. I won't read it out because I always find that pretty annoying when people do that. So, yeah. Um, also, like, there's no need to uh, screenshot these questions or anything because I'll be posting them in a slide, like in a little presentation after this at some stage. I'll wait until we get to like 25. Alrighty. Um, okay, cool. So most of you got it, which is really cool. So the answer is rosacea. Um, I think that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, um, basically the main things here is that this is a 40, like a middle-aged woman is quite common in. Um, if you look at the picture, I know the picture is quite small, but it's an ace of, ace of clubs distribution, which is the rash. Um, common for rosacea is they'll get flushing, which is like that telangiectasia kind of situation. Um, it's triggered by like alcohol, spicy food, and like sunlight makes it worse. Um, the other things I wanted to mention, oh, that's pretty much it. That's basically it. Um, the thing about acne is that you'll you'll get the presence of um, comedones and, and pustules and things, but you won't get that in rosacea. Um, and uh, SLE, you'll probably, um, yeah, it's more like the malar rash, like the butterfly distribution. Anyway, next one. If you have any questions, just type them in the chat as well, and we'll get to them eventually. All right, so I think that's enough time. So we just kind of have to race through these. Um, awesome, so everyone's really good at this. Uh, yeah, so it is D. I'm not gonna try to pronounce that because I'll screw it up. But basically the main things about this is that this lesion here is called the Herald patch. So with um, this condition, um, you start with, um, it's usually preceded by like a viral erty and that kind of thing. And then you'll get, um, you'll get a, um, yeah, a herald patch, which is like this lesion here, this oval region, uh, lesion. Um, and then later on, you'll get a generalized rash that develops over a, like a few days after the herald patch. Um, it's usually self-limiting um, and it kind of, yeah, the herald patch as well is also noted, like it's usually on the torso, so um, not on the arm or anything like that. Um, that's basically it. Other things is that this one is like a yeast infection and that's usually like the hypo, like changes in the pigmentation. Um, tinea or ringworm, that'll be, that's like the fungal infection um, and it's a red patches as well, but it usually has like a central clearing. Um, lichen planus, planus, whatever, um, is another sort of infection, but often like in MCQ land, you'll see um, they'll talk about a lesion on the on the back of the wrist, front of the wrist, sorry. Um, and it'll be like a shiny, hard plaque type, type situation.
So let me do this. Cool. Um, awesome stuff again. So this is gutate psoriasis. So the main things about this is that it commonly happens in kids. I'm sure it can happen in adults as well, but basically um, it's triggered by um, uh, usually like a streptococcal throat infection. Um, and then you'll get an acute onset of this like generalized um, widespread rash. And it's usually small papules um well plaques actually um and they present as like drop like lesions um which is yeah what this shows um and it's another thing to note is that it's really hard to treat so um there's not much treatment for it and it usually just resolves by itself in like several months So, because we don't have time, I'm just going to go. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, these are the two that like it kind of get confused. So, basically, this is contact dermatitis, which is basically when you get exposed to like a, an, a chemical. Well, there's lots of different types. You can have chemical, you can have irritant. Um, like the chemical one, which is what we're going for here, because this person is a cleaner. So, that's a risk factor. So, you're thinking they're probably contacting like yeah, cleaning agents, which um, can trigger a contact dermatitis. And it'll be like, um, like the time frame will be in, in line with like how often they're um, contacting this irritant. Um, and also, uh, yeah, that's the main thing. The treatment is like, it, it'll commonly be on like your hands if you're using your hands. So it'll be like mainly where you're actually touching that chemical. Um, the difference between like atopic dermatitis so atopic dermatitis is eczema. Um, and so that'll have, it'll have a similar appearance, but the distribution will be different. So you're usually, it's usually like a um, flexural surfaces. So um, like in your creases, like in your elbows and under your arms and that sort of thing. Um, in babies, it can be a bit different, um, but yeah. All right, um, so this one, perfect. So this one is superficial spreading melanoma. Um, so the reasons why it would be this is because um, it commonly, um, it's a most common type of melanoma. Um, so, and it commonly affects like um, middle-aged women as well. Um, it'll be uh, the main things to note. So it is, we did say that um, it's been there for as long as she can remember. And that's the reason why is because Often melanoma, um, it, it goes through this like in situ phase where it'll like, it, it won't cause any problems. And then all of a sudden it will start changing. So as soon as the lesion starts changing, um, that's when you become suspicious that it's turned into like a um, malignant melanoma. Um, and yeah, other things to note is like the lesion, it's irregular, there's differences in color. Um, it's been, yeah, spreading superficially, like there's no nodules or anything like that. So it's not a nodular melanoma. Um, and it's common in fair skinned people as well and tends to be in places um, like your legs, like your, your thighs or something where there's a lot of sun exposure at one point. For example, if someone's like swimming or something like that. Um, 
Lentigo maligna, I think that's the one where um, it's a precursor to melanoma. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Squamous cell, um, it won't be as pigmented. Um, yeah. Also, I'll have better explanations in the presentation I give you. Alrighty, so this one is solar keratosis. So the reason is because, um, so this is like just sun damaged skin um, and it's common in people who have been outside all the time. So we've said he's a, he's a retired dairy farmer indicating he's been outside a lot in the sun. Um, yeah, he's got no other like significant risk factors for a malignancy um, and they're just really, really common in old people. And you'll see it all the time in general practice. Often they'll treat it with like um, yeah, chirotherapy or something like that. Um, basal cell carcinoma, yeah, I guess would, um, yeah, you, you'd just be, it, it kind of looks different as well, but I, I'll explain that later. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm really sorry to do this, but I'm just going to do it. Okay, awesome. So this is like classic buzzword Monash situation, atorvastatin. Um, yeah, you can kind of get that the person would be on this because he's had an MI. Um, so they're usually on like the Saab, statin, ACE inhibitor, aspirin, and beta blocker. Um, and yeah, it's just muscle aches is the main thing. Thank you. Yeah, this is a bit of a harder one. Okay, in the interest of time, just going to stop it there. Um, okay, really good. So a lot of you got that. Um, I'll just spend a bit more time explaining this one. So there were a lot of distractors in here um, talking about pain and all like um, little appetite and things like that. But the main problem here is that this person has abdo pain and well, the main thing is fecal incontinence. Um, and so he cannot like control passage of small amounts of liquid stool, which is also important. So what this is classically suggesting is that there's um, uh, there's constipation causing um, uh, what's overflowing continence. I couldn't think of the word. 
Um, and basically what we do, we're not going to try to treat like the, the diarrhea that he's kind of showing. It's actually the main cause, the main problem is constipation. So we need to treat it, treat the constipation. So the things in this list, there's not that many that can treat the constipation. So A, there's also lactulose. I think those are the main things. Um, so Cloxal is the same as Docuzate. Um, as uh, Will pointed out earlier. Um, so that's the main thing that we would treat um, for, yeah, for um, overflow and continence. Um, the other thing is that loperamide, we're not gonna use that because it's a stimulant. Um, sorry, let me just, oh, sorry, no, because it's on an osmotic la laxative. So that will draw, um, water out of um like into the bowels and um it's probably not good for someone who's got like palliative and has like poor fluid intake because that'll make them even more dehydrated so you want to avoid a lactulose loperamide is like um that's used to treat diarrhea um but as i said the important thing to point out in here is the problem isn't diarrhea it's actually um constipation so that'll make it worse and it acts on opioid receptors. So the other thing is the, the, the constipation is caused by opioids and that's why we talk about pain. Sorry, I spent too long on that. There you go. Alrighty. Sorry, guys. I feel really bad. But anyway. Um, ah, okay. So this is hard. Um, basically, this is um, the problem here you've all recognized is the vomiting. Um, but the, the point of this is that it's due to um, poor gastric, uh, yeah, poor gastric emptying. Um, and so the first line um, option is a prokinetic agent, which will be met metoclopramide. The only time you wouldn't use metoclopramide is if you're um, thinking that this person has a mechanical bowel obstruction. And in that case, it's contraindicated because um, that'll stimulate the bowels to move. The a prokinetic agent will like, yeah, cause, um, yeah, uh, yeah, stimulation, which if there's a bowel obstruction, it can lead to um, perforation. So that's why we're choosing metoclopramide um, because, oh, sorry, the reason we're choosing that is because um, there's no signs of obstruction. So he's still opening his bowels, so he's not constipated, um, and there's no abdominal distension. Um, the other thing is between IV and oral, I guess the main thing here is that he has mainly nausea. He's only vomited once. So I think in all patients, you would always opt for the oral option rather than IV because IV is like invasive or whatever. Um, and oral, yeah, like he, like the risk is that like he'll vomit it back up, but he's only had one episode of vomiting. So I think you, you're going to be fine. Okay, because we're going to have to stop at 4.10. I'm just going to show the results. Okay. All right. So a bit of a mix of answers. So this one as well, I guess there are a few point, like a few different problems. But the main thing is that 
this person is wanting to um, be treated for comfort only now. That's like the main priority. And within that, pain is probably the biggest thing. So you can see that there, um, that she's having to use, um, like it is like her pain is well controlled with oral opioids, but now um, she's starting to have poor appetite and difficulty swallowing. So that to me indicates, okay, maybe she can't have oral tablets anymore. And we're thinking something like, um, yeah, either a patch or like subcutaneous thing. Um, but then the second thing is that she has a chronic kidney disease, like really poor renal function. So some, or most, well, a lot of opioids um, are renally excreted and um, a lot of them have, um, when they're broken down um, into their metabolites, they have like active metabolites and this can these can accumulate and they can actually be toxic when you have impaired renal function. So you'd want to go for something that doesn't have that, which is fentanyl, which I wouldn't expect anyone to know. I didn't know this, but um, fentanyl doesn't break down into active, like they break down into like non-active metabolites according to AMH. So it's not an issue for renal impairment. So you would switch to that. There's other opioids as well that you can switch to, but I didn't include them. I don't think we had much teaching on this today, which might be good to go through then. Alrighty, sorry again, giving you like 20 seconds to answer these, but cool. Okay, um, yeah, so this is chlamydia. Basically the main things here is that she's got a clear watery vaginal discharge and also dysuria. Um, it is important to note that chlamydia is often, I think like 75% of women don't get any symptoms, um, but it is one of the most common notifiable infect oh, STIs that's um, seen in Australia. So if ever in doubt, just go chlamydia. Um, and yeah, the main risk factors are new, like a new partner. She's um, engaging with sexual intercourse um, and she's not using condoms. So yeah, I would do that. I won't tell you other things because they'll come up. Oh, cool. Sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, cool. So, yeah. So basically, this one is bacterial vaginosis. So while this bacterial vaginosis isn't an STD, it is like a really, like one of the most common vaginal infections that women will get. Um, and a history of sexual intercourse is also a risk factor. But anyway, another risk factor that's pointing to towards this is the fact that she's got an IUD. Um, and yeah, so basically the main thing is it's a great gray white, um, malodorous discharge and that's classic. Um, and then the other things is that just to note, um, for diagnosis and you'd probably get this in an MCQ as well. I didn't add it, but, um, there's, you have to meet three out of four criteria for your, for the vaginal discharge. And that'll be like a positive whiff, whiff test the pH is above 4.5, so it's quite acidic. Um, and there'll be clue cells and also you get the gray white discharge. That's just what you remember. For um, candida infections, it'll be like a cottage cheese-like 
consistency of the discharge. It's kind of like, yeah, that's just how they describe it. Okay, this is the last question and then I think we have to stop because we're very over time. Um, but don't worry, all the questions will be on, like you, you'll still get them. Okay, so this one, cool, good job. Um, so I, I won't like ask you to tell me, but the main thing here is the diagnosis is gonorrhea. So this person has purulent urethral discharge um, and it's yellow green, that's classic. So I was gonna say with that first question we had on this, um, if you've got an STD question, it's gonna be either chlamydia or gonorrhea. And then the difference between them will be, gonorrhea will be like a yellow green color. Um, and that's how you treat it. The others, uh, that's how you treat chlamydia. Um, that would be for a genital herpes. That's for bacterial vaginosis. And that would be for a candida infection. And I think that's all we can do today. But yeah, the rest of the questions, so don't worry, there's more there. And then I've got even more um, that I'll be posting in a like PowerPoint presentation type thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.